Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday evening. Cheers. Good to see everybody. It has been, um, it's been a hell of a week, man. Everything going on in the world, we got to talk about. We got to get into, um, oh, you know, the Trump administration being exposed for carrying out a genocidal murder of uh, Democrats in blue states, which we got to get to, and we got to talk about schools, and we got to talk about, um, oh, yeah, that's right. The president of the United States of America floating the idea of uh, delaying the elections or, you know, maybe not even having elections. Who the hell knows? It's not like we live in a uh, representative democracy or anything. Uh, For me, I am really happy to be here tonight. Uh, This is much needed. I got I got my drink. I got my bottle of Woodford. Uh, We have a metric shit ton of questions to get to. So we're going to get to all that stuff. Before we do, uh, I'm incredibly happy to be here. Uh, As some of you might have seen as I posted on Twitter, uh, my little dog, my little long-haired black and tan dachshund, Leo, uh, was in the hospital for a few days, which was really surreal, having to like travel with him during a pandemic and have him in the hospital. Uh, But he's he's doing great. Uh, You wouldn't know that he's sick. He's jumping up. He's running around. That's the hardest problem is trying to keep him rested. So I just want to say, um, before we get going, that is awesome of every every one of you to just be so kind about that and send all kinds of well wishes. Uh, It's been a hard week. Um, It has been a lot, a lot. Uh, I was I was in Charleston, South Carolina, waiting on the dog to uh, get out of the hospital when, of course, the the president of the United States came out and floated the idea of delaying the election, which we're going to get into that um, in in uh, in length, because, I mean, we, it, I'm, I'm getting really upset that, uh, you know, everyone seems to think that everything is just going to be fine. And that our rules and laws and our constitution are just going to hold up because they've held up in the past or people think that they have when, in fact, they've always been in trouble. Uh, But the first thing I want to talk about, um, you know, uh, the the first question I wanted to start with was uh, by Joan. who says, what are the chances that Jared is charged with mass negligent homicide or even mass murder of people that died from COVID? Because he and Trump wanted to spread uh, COVID in blue states and help the chances stealing another four years. Isn't that something? I, I, I hope by now that you've read the Vanity Fair article. Um, you know, when this whole thing started, when Trump was playing politics with COVID, um, and it was obvious that he was keeping it from blue states, that he was um, basically holding governors ransom and basically making them praise him and give him quotes uh, for his reelection campaign in order to get life-saving supplies and... Uh, and ventilators and all of that. I mean, it was very obvious at that point that we had waited or jumped with both feet into a genocidal situation uh, where people were dying left and right because the president didn't agree with their politics or he wanted, you know, people to, you know, engage in fealty. I mean, that's who he is. And the sad truth is it was obvious coming into this that they were going to handle the pandemic this way. I mean, you know, we've talked about this on the the Muckrake podcast, Nick and I have. And it's like one of those things where you try and put yourself in the mindset of these people. And it is uh, it's nearly impossible. Like if I was in charge of trying to handle a pandemic, first of all, my thought would never be let's keep numbers down so I can win reelection. And I would never think, man, it's really great that my enemies are in the states where this stuff is happening. Uh, but he's, he's just a different breed of person. He really is. And for them to say that, you know, it, it, it's good politics or an opportunity somehow or another to score points is, is insane. The way that I think everybody else would have dealt with it. And I don't. And, and here's the thing. This isn't about Democrats or Republicans. I think I think most presidents would have said, let's put aside uh, are the video and audio cut down? Seems okay on my end. Hopefully not. So, you know, I think most people would have said, let's put politics aside because that's leadership, right? Um, said, who cares who you are and what you're doing? And, and that's not just leadership, but that's just like basic 
humanity. But the problem here, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, because I've had a couple of questions, weirdly enough, about um, about Russia. Um, you know, what was going on there and, and what the connection is between Trump and Russia and other groups like that. It's a corporate mindset. That's all it is. It's a corporate mindset where it's, you know, it's good for us. Maybe it's terrible for everyone else, which is unfortunately that sort of philosophy has led us to so many of the problems we have right now, including this pandemic, the way that it's working, but also global climate change, the, the upcoming climate crisis. I've talked about this multiple times. Um, uh, they are they are people who look at this for their profit first and foremost, and they're not really worried about what happens to people. I want you to think about for for a quick second. I want you to think about like um, a tobacco company or an energy company or some company that finds out that maybe their product is causing cancer or that maybe it's infecting townspeople. And for people whose immediate reaction to that is to say, okay, well, how many people and how big of a problem is this going to be for our brand versus how do we stop it? And that corporate mindset is part of what happens in a hyper-capitalistic society where if you suffer a crisis or you suffer some sort of you know, black mark against you, that's going to suddenly hurt your bottom line. Well, what ends up happening is you cover it up and cover it up and cover it up and you lead to tons of death and suffering. And then eventually it goes ahead and hurts your bottom line anyway. So th this isn't a sustainable type of system. And that's unfortunately how we ended up in this place. And Trump is engaged in this one time after another. I mean, I've talked about magical thinking. He just hoped that the pandemic would go away, that it would help his uh, you know, reelection campaign. And, and it is very sad. That's the thing. It's incredibly sad. It's just an anti-human type of philosophy, and it's disgusting, and it's caused so many deaths and so much suffering, and and it's just this it's this way of viewing the bottom line over people because suddenly people become cogs in a greater machine towards profit, and that's unfortunately what's happening with this pandemic. It's like okay, X number of people are going to die. Well, how does that compare to the cost of doing this or doing that? Which unfortunately is something that's happening with our schools, which we're going to talk about. Um, it's bad. It's a really bad scenario. And um, that philosophy has led to so much human suffering. And it, oh, it always leads to fascism. I, I know we always end up back on that road, but it's true. Because when you start dehumanizing people and you say, okay, those people are not more important than the bottom line for everyone, that's the issue, right? When you start going against uh, the idea of humanity mattering or human life mattering when it starts becoming more about your profit and your power, which is where Trump and his associates are. So yeah, they've engaged in genocide. There's no other way to put it. They truly believe that maybe New York or you know California might suffer during the coronavirus, but that our people, right, or Republicans or red states, um, this idea that you know it was going to eventually become a good thing for Trump, that's, that's genocide. He has an oath and, and actually he has a duty as a person. And that idea is that he has to take care of people. And that that is his duty. And unfortunately, when you reach a certain point of power and a certain point of greed, you end up there. And, and Julia brought up Dr. Burks. You know, I've talked about in the past with Trump, um, what I call a reality distortion field, which a lot of people talked about um, with, um, you know, like, oh, what's his name uh, from Apple? Uh, you know, you, you have this, I, Steve Jobs, this idea that people who are wealthy and powerful, they can make the people around them um, just sort of agree with what they're doing. And Burks got caught up in that. And all of a sudden, Burks went from being a person who, you know, was a medical expert to being somebody who brought Trump news that he wanted. And all of a sudden, everyone around Trump becomes a per. And if they stick around Trump, what ends up happening is Tim Apple. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they become a person that brings the leader or the powerful authoritarian, they bring them news that they want and they become bootleggers. And so they get caught up in this cycle and that's where they're at. And Burks absolutely got caught up in that. That's one of the reasons why Burks is right there with Trump and why Fauci is on the outside getting insulted every day is he just wanted to talk about science and Burks wanted to bring him graphs and information that he wanted to see. So anyway, it's, yeah, it absolutely is genocide. And I, I wish that other people in the media, uh, pundits and, and, you know, analysts, I wish that they would call it what it was. Um, people are really afraid to say it because it's a disturbing thing to admit that there's a genocide going on and, and that there are people who are dying needlessly. 
but they absolutely are. And that's unfortunately the situation we're in. All right, we've got a lot of questions tonight. Subversive says, would love to hear you address some of Trump's potentially disruptive election scenarios outlined by David Frum in the Atlantic. The David Frum article was really weird. Frum took a study that had just happened. So like there were, uh, there were a bunch of Democrats and Republicans and military people who got together and they did um, like a war games of the 2020 election to basically see what could happen, what could potentially take place. And it was this big study that was actually really interesting. And then from just used it for an article, which is weird. Like when you get that established and you don't really have to compete for article space anymore, you just kind of throw things out. I don't know. It was very odd. But the whole um, thrust of this study, what they ended up finding was that there are tons of scenarios where Trump not only subverts the election, but does it in an incredibly damaging way, uh, a permanently damaging way. <clears throat> and the people who played Trump's role, <clears throat> they ended up in like one scenario after another where there was violence in the streets, um, there are paramilitary organizations out in the streets, which, by the way, who could have predicted that except for, you know, all of us actually paying attention and that, you know, he was able to create a scenario where he took it to the courts and it ended up in a couple of cases getting thrown into the House of Representatives where there was a vote there, which I have to tell you that if Trump tries to subvert the election, I really doubt it's going to end up in the House of Representatives, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But it's just making clear what we've all been trying to tell you for the past couple of years which is that Donald Trump is not engaged in good faith politics. He doesn't engage in this from a professional way. He has no patriotism. He has no duty towards America. Like what we're getting ready to enter into, particularly leading up to November, and we're seeing that ratchet up, which if anybody's keeping track, I mean, there's a reason why he's threatening to delay the election. The heat is getting hotter. We're getting into a situation where he knows that he could potentially lose this thing. And even though he's deluded and insane, I think he understands that he's losing the election right now. He's just going to throw everything at the wall. And that war game, unfortunately, I don't think is even going to predict half of what he's capable of doing, simply because a lot of the people involved in it, I think they're restricted by their humanity. Trump's not restricted by his humanity. He isn't working in the same way that you and I would work in this case. Um, if anybody paid attention back in 2000 when Al Gore conceded the election, even though it, it appeared that he won, um, he did it because he wanted to maintain the integrity of the office of the presidency, because he wanted to maintain the integrity of the democratic system of America. Trump doesn't give a shit about any of that. He doesn't care about elections. He doesn't care about the Constitution or anything like that. If you asked him what's in the Constitution, I think it would be incredible how he wouldn't know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that this war game that we saw that simulated out the 2020 election, um, first of all, should just be just a, a, a giant flare up in the sky of anybody who is afraid of what could possibly happen, because it's mainstream sort of status quo people suddenly waking up and realizing how dangerous this is, which again, people like myself and Sarah Kinsey have been screaming about this for years. And each time that this stuff comes true, it's like this stuff isn't hard to predict. Like, it's not like I'm Nostradamus here with a crystal ball. What you have to do is you have to approach American politics in bad faith. And when you approach American politics in bad faith, what you end up finding out is that there aren't really guardrails if people aren't willing to defend these things. So no, it, it, it's, it's, it's an actual crisis in the waiting. So if you haven't uh, taken a look at it, you should. It's not Frum's article. I would just go find the War Game article itself. I, I thought Frum's thing was just a reheating of leftovers. Leslie says, I'd like to hear less about delaying the election, more about how Trump tweets distract media from the COVID pandemic and Trump recession. I would love not to talk about the delaying of the election. I would love if that wasn't a conversation because every time that he brings it up, it means there's more of a possibility of it happening. What Trump does is he throws things at the wall, and as he does it, he not only breaks precedent, but he creates new opportunities to destroy things. That's what destroyers do, and that's who he is. The unfortunate truth is in this situation with Trump, and Trump is not the first person. None of this is a plan. They're not meeting in a smoky room. They're not like, okay, today we need to distract from this. Tomorrow we need to distract from this. He's just, he's flailing about wildly and trying things. And again, he's not restricted by the stuff that you and I would be restricted by. Uh, and, and unfortunately, he's following the playbook, either instinctually or maybe it's been handed down to him. That hasn't been proven yet, but maybe it has. 
this is what happens in a post-political authoritarian state. So much stuff happens all the time that it wears you down to the point where you can't keep track of anything anymore. And that is one of those things that is absolutely happening, is that eventually it breaks your attention span, and all of a sudden you start arguing, this thing is distracting from this thing, this thing is distracting from this thing. We have to be able to walk and chew gum and do multiplication tables at, at once, because that's unfortunately what the post-political authoritarian state expects of us. Vicky, I just saw this, that you're, uh, you're going into school tomorrow. Should I quit? Uh, we're going to talk more about school openings here in a second, but I will say this. The fact that you are asking about this tells me that you are someone who cares about the fate of your, your students and someone who takes this thing seriously. I would make the argument that the fact that you care about it means that you make a difference in other people's lives and you give them more of a chance to be successful and, you know, survive during a pandemic. I can't tell you whether or not to quit, but I would much rather that somebody like that is navigating these situations than somebody who doesn't give a shit and doesn't pay attention to things. So that's that's up to you, obviously. And, and I think that's the thing. So I, I'm, I'm a professor, I'm a teacher, and I totally understand. And I want to, you know, I, I want to take care of my students too. Uh, but we're going to talk more about the school situation because I think that is, um, I think it's really telling. And I, I, I post about this on Twitter in a thread, I want to say yesterday, but you know, what is time? Um, I think that we can take a look at things like higher education and the educational system and what's going on there and understand better what's happening in this country because they're little microcosms. Yeah, I don't know why people think it's a distraction either, to be honest. I think it's because we want to believe that there's some order behind the madness. Like when you look at Trump, it's really scary to think that there's like a madman without duty and without good faith in the White House. Um, and, and when you look at it like that and it's like there's a madman behind the wheel, it's terrifying. It's much, much easier to believe that this madness has some sort of a math behind it, that there's a strategy, because at least if there's a strategy, there's some sort of order. The problem is that Trump's natural instincts, his inherent instincts are to behave like this. And it puts him in league with other fascists and other authoritarians and anti-democratic movements and other people use him and will collaborate with him. But he's not playing 4D chess. I keep telling people he'd be lucky if he didn't choke on the checkers, right? Um, so yeah, I don't think they're distractions. I think he just tries a lot of things real fast. Uh, Ben West says, do you think Trump is an aberration instead of a continuation of a long-term bad faith Republican project? I think he's both. I think the Republican party is a fascistic power movement that has brought us to this place with Trump. Uh, I think he himself is probably the least prepared president that we've ever had. So I believe he himself is an aberration, but I think that you couldn't have got here if the Republican party didn't lead us down this road. All right. Please discuss what you think might happen if Trump rejects his loss. I think just what I was talking about, and, and that was from uh, Cynthia. I, I, I think that it's going to be a situation where he throws everything at the wall. I think you're going to see violence in the streets. I think it's almost impossible at this point that we're not going to see violence in the streets. We already are. Like the media is not covering it as much as they should, and we're not talking about the crisis that's happening with this movement. Uh, the protest movement, but there are people going out in the streets and murdering protesters. They're running them over. They're shooting them. I mean, you know, they're, they're totally in favor. Oh, I'll answer that in a second about Facebook. Um, you know, there's, there's fascists in this country. So no, I don't think there's any chance that we get out of this election without um, tragedies. That's really sad, but it's true. I was trying to tell people this back in 2016 when I was covering the Trump campaign. I knew that there was going to be blood. I knew eventually there would be, and I knew that, unfortunately, there was probably going to be some people lose their lives. But the idea that we didn't lose a ton of lives, I thought was going to be an incredible stroke of luck if we got there. And now we've lost a lot of lives, <clears throat> and we're not really drawing the dots between the lives that we've lost. But I, I, I think leading up to this election, I, I, think, I think there's going to be blood in the streets. I don't know how much there's going to be. I don't know how bad it's going to be, but I really see I have, I have a hard time believing that there's not going to be. I've seen too much at this point. Creature from Black Lagoon says, who size Facebook on? Here's the thing. And I've talked about this in uh, prior streams and on the podcast before. Facebook's on the side of Facebook. 
they're non-political, they're post-political. And one of the things that I keep talking about is the idea that once you reach a certain point of wealth and power, you don't really, you're not left or right. You don't really have an ideology beyond pushing your ideology anymore eventually you get to a certain point where you're looking down at the game and the rest of us are talking about Republicans and Democrats and this bill and that bill and bathroom laws and the flag. People like Trump and Putin and all of the big tech like Facebook, Amazon, uh, you know, all these people, they're not, they're not playing the same game as us. They've already bought and sold all their politicians and they're creating a, a puppet state in terms of what a democracy would look like. They want to get past votes. They want to get past where you and I are making decisions and, and electing people. They, they want to turn this into a sham. They want to make it an illusion where all of a sudden the algorithm can take over for them. Um, you know, that's the problem here is they're not actually ideological. The only thing that somebody like Zuckerberg and the people around him wants is they want a system where their algorithm runs everything and they own everything. Because when you reach a certain point of wealth and power and influence, you just want to own everything. It, it turns into a different game. And somebody asked about Elon Musk. I'll, I'll, I'll say their name in a little bit. At that point, you know, if you're if you can afford a space program on your own, you just want to go to another planet and be king of that other planet. You're not interested in what votes happen in Congress. Facebook isn't either. They go out there and they pretend like they're political or that they care. It, it's bullshit. They don't care. They're doing their own game. And that game has nothing to do with us. Deanna says, how likely do you think it is that we'll see international interest in having poll observers? Straight up, if I was running the Democratic Party, and I, I keep saying this, I'm not a member of the Democratic Party. I have my problems with them. Uh, I, I have my issues with how they handle their business. But if I was in the Democratic Party, I would be asking for international observers right now. I, I, if we, our elections have not been free and fair in forever and it isn't just about people being made to wait outside of polls, which, by the way, they're going to be made to do that during a pandemic again. But on top of that, disenfranchising, all of the gerrymandering, our democracy has not been healthy in a long time. And it didn't really exist at first. And then for a while we had a shot at it and then it just got sick and taken over again. So, no, if I if, if the Democrats were actually serious, they would be talking about international observers right now. That would be an issue that would be talked about right now. I would definitely have them in. Alfonso said, is this pandemic response disaster the beginning of the end of the American empire? So here's the thing. We got, we got a bunch of stuff to talk about tonight. Uh, we're going to get to hope. I promise. We're going to end this thing with some hope. But I want to be honest with you for a second. Um, we're in a situation right now where we are watching the American empire in decline. I think you know it. If you're hanging out with me on a Sunday drinking bourbon, um, I think you know it. This empire was always going to start declining. That's just what happens with empires. Um, this whole thing has been more or less uh, a consequence of decades upon decades and generations upon generations of anti-democratic movements and moments. And this one in particular, like you can trace this back. I mean, you know, you could, you could argue about when the, the fuse was lit. Right. We could make the argument it happened in the 1950s and 60s, whenever civil rights all of a sudden caused the Republican Party to not just go right, but just to dive deep, deep, deep into white identity politics. You can make the argument, of course, that Richard Nixon set a precedent for future presidents. You could make the argument that Ronald Reagan's hypercapitalism set us up for all of this suffering that we're dealing with now. Uh, if you want to get really, really modern, I, I think you can make an argument that September 11th and the forever wars that happened as a result of that um, are a big part of the reason why we're there. Uh, I mean, we had a chance post September 11th to like all these people, Bush and Cheney and all these Straussians, they all talk about like, you know, the idea the mythology of like a mission and a crusade and, and American hegemony. We had a chance. I'm going to answer that in a second, Joan. Uh, we had a chance to really create a, a so-called new order after September 11th that would have been based on international cooperation. But instead, we started up forever wars. Um, one of them was ill-advised. The other one was totally illegal and resulted in not just quagmires, but it took all of our blood and treasure, things that we could have used to make lives better, 
We could have had a better educational system. We could have had a uh, healthcare system that right now would be helping us. Uh, we could have suddenly gotten the entire world on the same page and started working towards things like taking care of climate change. We could have had better lives. But instead, we had a group of people who wanted to use September 11th in order to push their power goals. So that's what ends up happening when you have like that giant of a mistake and you have generations of mistakes ahead of it. You reach a point where American empire is in decline. Now, does that mean America is going to fall? No, it doesn't. We still have a chance. We still have a chance to make this country more human and stable and real because this country has been so fake for so long that we need to have a new type of project and reconstruction. It's going to be hard. Do not get me wrong, because someone like Trump is a destroyer who could you know, plunge us into the abyss and could actually lead to the complete uh, loss of empire, or whatever you want to call it. I would make the argument we shouldn't be an empire in the first place. That's a different argument. But I think post-Trump, we might be able to find a way forward, but it's going to have to be grassroots up. It can't be top down because when it's top down, it always is going to lead to hypercapitalism and fascism, unfortunately. Um, Joan, I just saw Joan. Uh, Joan asked a question. Oh, so is the American empire so great? I don't think so. I took advantage of the little guy. I wrote a book, American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. Uh, I think we took over the way of the world but we didn't do it in an honest way. We sat here and we promoted ourselves through propaganda and manipulation as being a country obsessed with liberty, freedom, and equality. We didn't mean it from the very beginning, but it was a hell of a propaganda tool and one of the, what I would argue is one of the strongest weapons ever created. So no, was the American empire so great? I think that we had moments of achievement that people would argue was great, but ethically, morally, I think we did a lot of rough stuff. And I think the things that we're talking about now in terms of where America is, I think we're suddenly looking at it. I think we can't look away. And Trump makes us realize who we are and who we've been, right? It, it kind of ends the spell a little bit. Becky, the book's coming out real soon. I, I was actually sitting here today, like, and I was like, man, American Rule comes out in a month. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed about it. I'm, I'm excited. I'm terrified. The reviews have been good so far. People have been enjoying it, but I'm a little scared. It's coming out next month. It's like the biggest thing I've ever done. And I'm really, really proud of it. And if you enjoy my stuff, if you enjoy these talks, you enjoy my Twitter stuff, you should check out American Rule. I'm very, very proud of it, but I'm terrified. It comes out next month. Cheers. Uh, Gary, a seeming advantage of the U.S. system is checks and balances between branches of government. We now know what easily breaks when one branch just ignores, uh, ignores the checking power of the others. How is that fixed? So there's a big thing. Catherine Stewart's book is really good. Um... So here's the problem with America that a lot of us... So James Madison... Actually, let's turn this thing on. All right. Hey, what's up, everyone? So James Madison's uh, construction of how America would work um, is based on uh, this triangular sort of construction that Montesquieu, a French guy, created. And the entire idea was that it would be a way to basically give a visage of democracy while containing power with the wealthy and the elite and, oh yeah, the male and the white and usually the slave-holding white males. Um, the problem is that when uh, the founders, and by the way, uh, I, again, I've talked about this before, um, the founders who, who crafted the constitution, they weren't supposed to put together a constitution. Um, they, they were actually there to revise the Articles of Confederation and James Madison's like, hey, I got an idea, who's coming with me? So the Constitution ends up becoming an illusion of the idea of representation and democracy and equality, but it actually becomes sort of like this place where the executive and the Senate are repositories for the wealthy and powerful. So they end up taking the House of Representatives to make it seem like Americans have representatives, but the Senate is only for like the wealthy landholding few. And they say that they are the safest repositories of democracy. So it ends up becoming this thing where it's like, oh, here are the peons over here and all the wealthy people are over here and we have control. So here's the problem. And, and I, I, I was with these um, people for a while and they're like, oh my God, I bet the founding fathers are rolling over in their graves about Trump. Not really. The founding fathers believed that whiteness, maleness and wealth meant that you were capable. So if they were told that Donald Trump was president and they were told who he was, they would be pumped about that. They would think that was great. And then, of course, what they would find out is that white males who are wealthy are not necessarily loyal. 
they don't necessarily have duty. They thought that anybody who had like a vested interest in America in terms of like owning property or having, you know, wealth or whatever, they thought that those people would just automatically want to take care of America. It never occurred to them that we could ever have a president who feasted on America like a tick on a dog. And, and so what ends up happening is you, Trump is not the type of president that we've had in the past. Other presidents at least tried to do what they thought was good for America, and a lot of their motives were screwed up, and they really were awful in other times. Trump has no loyalty. He has no duty. For him, and it's like John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy kept saying, it's not what your country can do for you. It's what you can do for your country. Trump's the exact opposite. He has always viewed America as a body that he could feast on, like a parasite. And that's who he is. And, and the problem is that they thought that if you were wealthy and white and a man and powerful, that you would just make a great leader. That's what they believed. And that's one of the problems with America is that it was founded on white supremacist patriarchal power. So we have to change a lot of things. We have to change the American presidency, which has grown so out of control. Hey, Ethan, glad you're here. Uh, one of the things that has gone wrong is the American presidency has grown and grown and grown and grown. And it's gotten to the point where every president takes more and more power. And they always do this thing. And it's every president that every president in modern history does this. They push the envelope a little bit further. They figure out a way to get a little bit more power. And a lot of this has to do with the uh, post-war nuclear presidency, which is the idea that, you know, you have this person who is in charge and they have like almost godlike power. The American presidency needs to be reined in. It's a really gross institution at this point. They're above the law. The power that they wield is just wrong. So we have to get back to a point where factionalism doesn't weigh in on all this. So right now, the Republican Party would never hold Trump accountable because he's good for their power. Do I think parliamentary system would be better than what we have now? I think, I think this system could be reformed. I think what we need is we need campaign finance reform. We need, need to get rid of Citizens United. And we need to get it to a point where regular people can run for office and want to run for office. If you want to run for office now, you either have to be a millionaire or you have to buy and sell yourself to the nearest bidder. I keep trying to tell people this. We'll have a better country and a better government when normal people want to serve. Because just having wealth, um, just having wealth and power doesn't mean you're a good leader. Matter of fact, having wealth and power sometimes means that you'd be a terrible leader because you would be selfish. And so this is one of those situations where we need to revise the entire system of how you run for government and who is in charge. Because right now it's, it's failing. Tabitha. Hey, Tabitha. I hope you're well. Cheers. Is there anything we can do besides buy some stamps to save the post office? And also, Jim, to go along with that, how concerned are you about reported mail delays happening with the USPS? There's a lot going on with the post office, um, and it's not just about the election. And I feel like I feel like one of the biggest problems people keep making with Trump is they keep saying, OK, here's the silver bullet explanation of what's going on. It's always multiple things. So on one is the post office under attack because of the election. Yeah, absolutely. That is part of it. There's another thing that's going on, too. The post office is a, a, a public institution. These people want to privatize it. They want like a FedEx or a UPS to take over. And they want to do it because the, the thing that the American right wants to do is they want to privatize everything and just juice it and juice it and juice it. If they had their way, we wouldn't be able to ride on a highway system without paying one toll after another literally everywhere that we go. They want to lead to a system where the public doesn't really have anything anymore and we're just continually redistributing our wealth upwards. Right. So that's one of the problems. The other thing is that the post office is like this democratic institution where we're able to not only connect with one another, but it, it, it combines us. It brings us together. It's one of the ties that we have. And it's one of the things that separates us from a society that is atomized and doesn't have any sort of connection anymore. If all of a sudden you take communication and you put it all online, here's the problem. The Internet is completely commodified. The internet is just, it, it, everything about it is about profit and competition and being juiced to the gills about how to make money off of it. Also, if we had, you know, uh, let's say we had privatized post office, you have no guarantee of freedom. Uh, uh, you have no idea of privacy. You're not guaranteed privacy if it's not public. 
all of a sudden they can do whatever they want with it. They can they can look at your communications. If you all of a sudden you're sending out ballots like that, you think a privatized institution where you're sending out ballots, you think something isn't going to go wrong there? Something's going to go wrong there. On top of that, I was just and here's a weird thing that I'm starting to kind of like work through. And by the way, I, I was hesitant. I was looking at this question and I wanted to bring this up. And I, I want to put caution out there because this was weird. I, I was reading a book. It's called Rave Rock. It's about um, contingency plans in case of nuclear war, particularly during uh, uh, the Cold War. Uh, yeah, the police force has become privatized, which is a big, giant mess. Apparently, in contingency plans, uh, all these different government institutions were given roles that you wouldn't expect. <sighs> oh, we'll talk about that in a second, Joan. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, one of the contingency plans called on the Postal Service being the, uh, the, the people who administered vaccines during a pandemic. I just found that out the other day. Kind of stopped me in my tracks. I had no idea. I had never heard that before. But apparently one of the contingency plans was for the post office to administer vaccines during a pandemic. That's weird. I don't know what to do with it. And that's the thing. I, I'm not going to sit here. I'm not going to spin out conspiracy theories or whatever. That's really, really damn weird. And so I've, I've been sitting with that for a while. And through all my research, I keep finding that that's true. They're supposed to be the ones who are administering vaccines during a major pandemic. I don't know what to do with that. Real fast, John said, what's the deal on social media with everyone worried about um, child sex trafficking? A couple things. One, uh, Many of the conspiracy theories that go back for centuries and centuries are based on a thing called blood libel. This idea that like Jewish people, uh, you know, murder children and use their bodies. There's this there's always been this idea that wealthy elite people uh, destroy children. Uh, that's actually where vampires came from. Poor people would look at uh, wealthy people who didn't seem to age and they believed that they were drinking the blood of uh, poor younger people. So we're in another situation of vast economic inequality. Uh, we have a bunch of poor people in this country who are barely making by. There's the metaphor that the wealthy and the rich are sort of feasting upon us. So as a result, that metaphor continues. But there's another problem, which is that there actually are child sex rings. That's a real thing. And it's, it's not a coincidence that as this Epstein thing is sort of like coming up and like becoming a big giant story. Um, it's not a coincidence that these conspiracy theories are continually going and ramping up. But it's also this idea. It's about satanic panic. It's about these conspiracy theories. And it's making the idea of economic inequality top down. It's making it feel like people are feasting on other people and, of course, taking advantage of children, which, you know, we have a situation where America's school kids are unfortunately going to be thrust into a pandemic. Vance says, full disclosure, I'm an open-minded libertarian. My two daughters are nurses. Question, early in the pandemic, we were told by the doctors that masks would not work to not be to not buy masks, wear a mask. If you have a virus, people contracted COVID during the mask. So this is something I'm actually really glad you brought this up, Vance. And I hope you're I hope you're watching. One of the problems that nobody wants to talk about in this pandemic, particularly with the mask situation, is that one, there was a failure of leadership and communication. Um, in the very beginning, we were told that, you know, leave masks alone and let medical professionals get them, right? So that's a message right there. You know, don't buy these masks. And then on top of it, there was a problem here. And one of the problems that, that we have a moment uh, of people denying these things about the mask, it's an American problem. So I wear a mask for you. You wear a mask for me. But America has been so steeped in hypercapitalism and game theory. I need to win. You need to lose. If you win, I lose. The idea of wearing a mask for other people doesn't come through. The American idea of taking care of other people by doing something has unfortunately been completely ruined by Reagan-esque hypercapitalism. So that's one of the things that has happened here. Masks work because it's about taking care of one another and lowering the risk. But Americans, that, that entire messaging was screwed up from the very beginning. And eventually, and, and I think it'll probably be five to 10 years, there are going to be some amazing studies that are going to be done about the misinformation and the harm that the Trump administration has done in terms of bad communication. All right. It's my country says, I keep hearing of Trump's, Trump X's the election that makes Speaker Pelosi POTUS. House members are elected every two years. 
this whole thing, literally, whatever people tell you about, oh, this will work and this will work and this is how it'll work and this is how it'll work, it's all bullshit. And I hate to tell you this because there's some really smart people out there who are like, oh, Trump could never do this because of this. I understand why they're saying that. These are rules that have been created to rein in people like Trump, but they can't rein in people like Trump because they don't give a shit about rules. Authoritarians create new rules. One of the more um, damning things that you find out about authoritarianism and fascist is that they will take your rules and then they'll just bulldoze them and then they'll make new rules. And those new rules will take care of them. They will actually take the law, pervert it, and, and, and just change it completely in order to serve their own interest. So, listen, I understand that Trump in January is not going to be president and whatever, and, and he'll be escorted out, or that's what's supposed to happen. And maybe it will. But you cannot hide behind precedents and laws during the ramp up to an authoritarian fascist regime. They don't care. They do not care what it says on a parchment. They don't care what it says in, in a federal office building. They only care about themselves and their own power and profit. That's it. They could give a shit about your constitution. They could give a shit about your laws. They will destroy them. So yeah, Trump should be let out in January, but that doesn't mean that he will because there is an opportunity for someone like like Trump to destroy the law and make their own laws. So yeah, I understand that we all want to sort of say that everything will be fine and everybody's being an alarmist. We're not being an alarmist. We're not being alarmist. We're telling you what can happen. We're telling you because these people are not acting in good faith. And when you don't act in good faith, laws and constitutions and norms don't matter. So you have to be aware that there's a possibility that things could get very, very bad. And that's why you have to be ready. That's why we have to talk about mass action. And that's why we have to talk about contingency plans with these people. We're trying to tell you what could happen because these people will do it. You cannot hide behind precedent or laws or constitutions in these things. You have to be ready to be in the streets. You just do. Monday says, so many questions, so little time. What are your thoughts on a ridiculous GOP COVID relief package, including new jets? Hey, congrats, military industrial complex. The GDP drop, the raging pandemic, potential constitutional crisis. At what point would America be considered a failed state? We are a failing state. Uh, the problem is that this government does not serve the will of the people anymore. The social contract has been broken. Uh, the government has been bought and sold by the wealthy, powerful, and the elite, and it serves their interest. And by the way, that's on both sides. It happens to be that the Democratic Party still cares about democratic institutions and they'll respect the will of the people if there's a vote. The Republican Party doesn't give a shit about that, and they've realized they can't really win elections anymore. And so they'll just steamroll democratic institutions, which is what fascist movements do. Uh, this country doesn't serve the people anymore. It serves wealthy interests. And people believe that it trickles down. They believe that, okay, if we help the wealthy and the powerful, then eventually they'll create jobs and the economy will be great. Because these people think that everything springs forth from the economy. They truly and honestly believe that if you just tend to the economy like a garden, the rest of us will be okay. Well, that's not how it works. And history shows us that that is not true. The truth is you have to take care of the economy plus the people at the same time. And if you don't, the state ends up failing because eventually the wealthy and the powerful take over government and the government loses all of its sovereignty because the social contract is, is violated. So America is a failing state. What we're watching right now with the Republican Party with this COVID relief bill, which is bullshit, they're just attempting to score points. That's all they're doing. This is about redistribution of wealth. And they always tell us, that the left is interested in redistributing the wealth from the top down. What they're interested in doing is redistributing our money and sending it to the top because they believe that we're not capable of doing good things with our money. They think we're irresponsible. They think we're incompetent. They think we're losers because going back to the founding fathers and the idea of prosperity gospel and white supremacy, if you're not rich, then you ain't nothing. And if you ain't nothing, you shouldn't even have your money. Like, just shut up and let us decide what's good for you. That's literally the philosophy they have. So yeah, they're going to take our money and they're going to feed it into the military industrial complex and they're going to redistribute it because that is who they actually serve. They serve corporations and they serve the military industrial complex. Steve, 
I'm a follower of Chris Hedges, and he's been predicting a breakdown of democracy in the U.S. for a few years, even pre-Trump. Do you think there's a mechanism at work that is sidelining astute, rational voices so they go unheard on mainstream media? I'm just going to take a drink there before I decide how to answer that. Here's the problem. Uh, I think there are a lot of journalists and a lot of pundits and a lot of analysts who do really good work. Um, you know, at CNN, MSNBC, The New York Times, Washington Post, there are a lot of brilliant people who are working incredibly hard and they do good journalism and they do good analysis. The problem is that those institutions are the, the mainstream institutions. They're corporate institutions. They they will criticize, you know, the wealthy and the powerful to a certain extent. But they're almost always focused on a status quo sort of uh, accumulation of power. That's just the honest to God truth. And so what ends up happening is that people who I don't know, warn about authoritarian and fascism, like yours truly, will get on these things or will occasionally get these publications. But we're basically told quietly to rein it in. Because you can't be seen as an alarmist. Because if you're an alarmist, you're seen as being unreasonable. And then what ends up happening, and by the way, working on my bourbon tonight, and we're, we're at 45 minutes, so whatever. You end up getting proved right. And I keep watching these things, and it kind of drives me crazy where people are taking things that, like, I've written in threads or in articles, or my blog, The Muckrake. Sarah Kinzier has written in her books and her articles and talked about in interviews. And eventually they look up and they're like, oh, my God, there's fascism on the rise and authoritarian on the rise. Oh, these people, maybe they know what they talk about. And then they just recycle them and they go with them. We're in one of those moments now. I mean, we've been crying about fascism since Trump threw his hat in because it's obvious. It's not hard to predict. So there's a status quo there. And one of the reasons and this is something if you take nothing away, nothing else away from this talk, this is something to think about. One of the problems is that the people who are particularly successful in journalism and politics and in the media, those, those people have seen the system and they think it works because it's worked for them. So when you've been successful in that system, all of a sudden you start believing that that system is inherently good because didn't it raise you up to the top? And all of a sudden you get a lot of people who are very worried about the status quo and they simply believe that people like Trump are going to be spit up like so much bad food. They think that the system is healthy and good and it works. And they think that this Trump thing is an aberration. And they still, you know, most of them are like, well, you know, I'm a Democrat and Ronald Reagan was Republican, but, you know, he looked great on a horse. Or didn't you love it when he was at the Berlin Wall? They believe in the mythology of America. And so they keep looking at this thing through the lens of the mythology of American exceptionalism, and they just keep expecting it to get better. So that's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of these people talking about this stuff on the evening news or in the papers of record is because they still believe in the mythology of America that isn't true. The mythology, by the way, that I write about and dissect in American Rule. So there's that. All right. Uh, next up, Monica says, whether you find QAnon conspiracy pro propaganda to arise from or be connected to the worldwide neo-fascist movement. Real fast. If you haven't, there's this car in my neighborhood that just races up and down and just has backfires left and right. It's, it's just incredible. It's, it's just started happening in the past week. It is. It's uh, southeastern Georgia. I like it quite a bit. Um, that was fun, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get it. Oh, man. Okay. So if you haven't already, I would recommend, um, yeah, that's a car. No, I can recognize at this one. I can recognize where the gunshots are and I can recognize where like the, the backfires are. Okay, so there's this article that was in the New York Times today. I thought it should have gotten more traction, than, more traction than it did. He's just going around. He's getting after it, man. He's having him a hell of a Sunday night. Uh, that article about um, Day X in Germany, where there's like a major white nationalist extremist movement that's taking over. Um, one of the things, and I was talking about it on Twitter, if you didn't see it earlier today, there is a worldwide fascistic movement. And by that, I mean that all around the globe, there are people who are neo-fascist. And I don't mean that they're just, they happen to be fascist. I mean that they study 
fascism. There was a really good book. Actually, I put together a reading list that um, if you're interested in getting, we're putting together um, uh, Patreon people for the Muckrake podcast. If you're interested, you can send an email to muckrakepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we're getting ready to have some news about that, about some special projects that we're doing. But I put together a reading list. And one of the things on there, I believe it's called Battle for Eternity. And it's a really interesting book about uh, Steve Bannon and neo-fascists in, um, in, in the world right now who are sort of linking up and they're finding common ground. And they want to, like, basically throw us into the past. They're interested in getting rid of the idea of liberal democracy. And they want to throw us back into a time where the wealthy and powerful, particularly white males, were dictators. That's happening all over the world. It's happening here in America with multiple white extremists. It's happening in Russia with a group called Imperial and all of their associated paramilitary groups. It's happening in Germany with those groups. They're all coming together. Now, does that mean that QAnon is their project? I don't think it is. I think QAnon is an aberration. It's a phenomenon that started out on these forums. It started out as a grift or sort of like a LARPing exercise, and then it took off. Now, does that mean that it isn't now being used for it or that it doesn't contribute to it? No, absolutely it does, because it has changed hands, and it's become completely fascistic. And everything it talks about with everything from, you know, uh, digital soldier oaths to the idea of people needing to be uh, captured and killed and executed, all that stuff, that's fascistic. So one of the things that I've seen, unfortunately, and I don't know if you've seen it as well, and I hope that you haven't, like my family members, people I care about, they're starting to share QAnon shit and they don't know what it is. And they're starting to share white supremacist fascistic shit. And they don't particularly know what it is. They only know that it, like, it goes after Black Lives Matter and it talks about you know white pride or whatever. So these conspiracy theories are turning into a radicalizing agent. And I've talked to one white nationalist, neo-Nazi after another, who have left the fold, who tell you that they go after people who are upset, who are upset or they're insecure, and they bring them into the fold. So do I think QAnon started off that way? No, I don't. But I think it has turned into a hell of a way to radicalize people and bring them into a fascist umbrella. Because the QAnon alternate reality is a reality where you can't trust the government anymore. You just have to go out and you have to capture people and kill people. It's a really frightening thing, and it's become a radicalizing tool for sure. Oh, okay, Catherine said the neo-Nazi group in Germany. Equally frightening is that they're being charged as a terrorist organization. Do you think we have any means of stopping similar groups here? Um, I'm sorry, Catherine, we don't right now. Uh, the United States government has said for years, and, and this is something, and, and by the way, this is a problem. Uh, you know, the media doesn't really report on this. They don't want to talk about white supremacy. They don't want to talk about the problem because, unfortunately, once you start talking about white supremacy and economic inequality, the whole ball of wax starts coming apart. Uh, we've had a problem with white terrorism in this country for decades, and they've been growing and training and growing more and more dangerous by the day. Uh, we do not have we we're not able to just stop them right now because we're afraid to talk about them. The moment that we start talking about paramilitary organizations and white supremacy in this country is the moment that we start having to deal with white supremacy and economic inequality. And the moment we do that, we have to start thinking about who we are and, and where we've come from. This is one of the reasons why you have people who talk about online that they're white supremacist and that they're fascist. And then they go into, I don't know, a Walmart or a church in South Carolina and they mow a bunch of people down. And everyone's like, oh, what a lone nut. Who is this disturbed young man? And then they don't connect the dots that this is a white terrorist because we have had this problem for a very, very long time. So, no, we do not have things in place to take care of them because we don't want to believe they're real. Because the moment we start believing them they're real is the moment that we start having to deal with our own shit. And you're exactly right, Lucky Otter. It's like our own ISIS or Al Qaeda. They're the exact same. It just so happens they're on the opposite side of the coin. They're on the Christian side. They're on the white side. These people have been looking at ISIS and Al Qaeda and they've been taking notes. They admire them. They don't agree with their role, which, of course, is like Islamic nationalism or fundamentalism. But they've been looking at them and they've been inspired by them. So, yeah, absolutely. It's our own terrorist network. And we just we, we can't even understand that it's real. Jack, my wife and I have a date to watch. Hey, Jack. Jack and his wife. Cheers. That's awesome. Yeah, let's finish this class. All right. Jack says. 
What are your thoughts on something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? I think we need something. I don't know what that something is. I'll be honest with you. Um, I think it would be great if we could have some sort of a truth commission when this whole thing is over. Um, it would have to be bipartisan. And I'm talking like we would have to get some people who just, um, who just, oh, real fast. Seth says, do you see sex work becoming legal ever? No, because I, I think that would give them too much power and we're in a patriarchal society. Uh a truth commission would have to involve some people that people on the right would trust. I do think, and by the way, I, I keep telling people this left and right. I do not think that Donald Trump getting voted out and Joe Biden taking over makes everything better. I think Trump is a symptom of a larger disease. And I don't think Biden just makes everything get completely better because this thing, this thing has been boiling up for decades and generations, honestly. Uh, but I do think that if Biden wins, I think te the temperature will go down. I think the Trumpist will still be Trumpist. I think we'll still have extremists that we have to worry about and fascists we have to worry about. But I do think the temperature will go down and you will be able to reach some of those people with maybe some bipartisan committees. But I really, really do think that something like a truth commission would be incredibly important. And I keep I keep telling people uh, if Biden wins, Trump should be investigated. There have been not just too many crimes, there's been treason, there's been genocide, uh, that you cannot let these people go. You can't just throw a pardon at them like Ford on Nixon. Like, we have to deal with this stuff. Because the fact that Nixon was pardoned just opened the door for more and more things that have happened in the wake of Nixon. People behaving like Nixon and thinking they can get away with it. Uh, Jack's wife included a question. Recently read Timothy Snyder's book. And by the way, Timothy Snyder uh, has done incredible work. And this is one of those people who has been calling this what it has been for the last few years and deserves credit for that. And I and, and by the way, if, if it sounds like I'm, you know, tipping my cap and just giving way too much uh, credit to other people, I have to tell you, it is a lonely, lonely time talking about this stuff and 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 talking about the 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 danger that we are under and there aren't that many of us because there, there are so many people who have just been called alarmist and they've been written off as if they're not serious people so again that's that's one of the reasons why i point out like chalupa and kinsier and snyder is it, it's a lonely road and we have we've unfortunately been having to do this thing while receiving criticism for just literally talking about what's going on so yeah snyder's fantastic all of his books are well worth reading was disturbed to learn that he left the country. Do you think it's too late to escape the descent into total fascism? Is that something we can still avoid or is it too late? No, we can avoid it. In fact, not only can we avoid it, we have seen it time and time and time again where America has teetered on the edge of full-blown fascism and we've moved away from it. I think this could be a moment. And again, it doesn't mean it'll happen. It doesn't mean we can rest on our laurels because we're in a lot of danger. This could be a moment where we get a glimpse of something really ugly and really dangerous. And we look at it, we recognize it, we see what it is, and we recoil in horror and we become better ourselves. This could be a moment in American history that we get past so much of our past fascism and we become a better country and we start realizing our espoused principles. Does that mean it'll happen? Not necessarily. Like, like I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you. Like, um, this is a dangerous moment. This could get really bad. It really could. And and for those of you who are like, oh, it's America. It can never happen. It can happen. So this is an incredibly dangerous moment. But my hope, again, is that we see where we were and what we were teetering on the brink of. And we recognize that it was incredibly dangerous. And we change. And we, we get into better people. And we become better people. Yeah, by the way, I saw someone bring up Bloodlands. I think that is, Sean brought it up. I think Bloodlands is absolutely necessary reading so you can understand not just the mythology of fascism, but the actual logistics of fascism. The disgusting way that that toxin and poison gets into the system and the state and corrodes it from the inside out, which is something, unfortunately, that we're looking at right now, particularly with the DOJ and particularly with the idea of a second Trump term. Haley Cotton. Oh, God, that just sounds bad. I think violence could happen in our cities and also our rural areas. I think it could happen everywhere. That's the sad truth of it. I, I, I think that we're uh, in there. What do we do? Mark says, what do we do if Trump wins and the slide continues? I think you've got to keep fighting. I think at that point we have to start talking about mass action. 
We have to th- talk about things like solidarity, mass strikes. We have to talk about throwing the bodies on the gears. I mean, that's just the truth. I mean, you know, that, unfortunately, that's what they, they realized in the 60s and the 70s with the Vietnam War and the technocracy and the military industrial complex. Eventually, you realize you have to throw yourselves on the gears. And I have to say that there is a real possibility that if Trump wins reelection, the 60s and 70s and the bloodshed of that time are going to look like a picnic. I know that sounds terrible, but it's true. But I think I, 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 I think there's hope. Break down social structure. Unfortunately, I think social structure will continue regardless of what happens. But uh, I, I, I think that I think we're looking at a breakdown of the political structure. Hey, we're five minutes or five seconds out from one hour. Two, one. Cheers. All right. We still got some questions. Thanks for hanging out. It's awesome of you. I keep saying that. It is legitimately awesome of you that you want to hang out with me on a Sunday night. And, and drink bourbon or whatever you're doing and just hang out and talk about this stuff. I have to tell you, it, it is it blows my mind all the time and it fills my heart up. It's been a rough week with Trump and the pandemic and things, you know, with my dog and just personal stuff and, and things with the school system. And I uh, this gives me so much energy and love and I appreciate it. I really do. I get sappy at the end, but I'm getting sappy right now at the one hour mark. All right. Nancy says, I've caught three of your talks. Three of my talks. Just hanging out, looking at my talks. That's awesome. Thanks, Nancy. Post-Trump, what do we do about revealed fascists and supremacists and the unrevealed ones hiding in our law enforcement and military institutions? This is a great question. Um, Here's the problem. We have to, first off, we have to understand that fascism is part of the human condition. We have to understand that there are fascists in every country around the world at all times. And I know that that sucks. I know that that's frightening, but the moment that you realize that is the moment that you start realizing that it's not just some sort of weird thing that pops up out of the ground. We have to understand that this is a constant threat in our world. Now that we know that America has fascists, and now that we know that authoritarians exist in this country who would be willing to get behind someone as disgusting as Donald Trump, now we have to, we have to get to the point where these people aren't allowed in the discourse anymore. Right. They're not allowed on a CNN panel. They're not allowed on an MSNBC panel. When Fox News brings these people on to talk about fascist ideas, their uh, their uh, sponsors, their advertisers need to pull out their money immediately. We need to recognize that right now we have a situation where fascists and authoritarians have gained power, purchase and authority in this country. So first things first is you have to take all of that off the table. And I think this is one of those situations where Trump has made it clear that there are a lot of dangerous people in this country who do not deserve to be leaders and that they are really incredibly dangerous people who don't deserve sway or authority. I think that's first off. Second off, I think that in any country that is sane or healthy, and by the way, that country um, isn't like that. Hey, Michael Leonard, thanks for hanging out. It's so nice. I miss you being in my class too. Ah, old students. How cool is that? Full of shit. I think in a sane country, um, you would have huge investigations into our law enforcement. And you would go into police departments. You would go into things like the National Guard. You would go into our defense institutions. You go into all of those. Uh, 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 prison guards, you name it. And you would find people who have espoused white supremacist views. And they'd be got rid of. Because there's no room for them. You need a president and an administration that takes this stuff seriously and says we have no room in positions of authority and positions where you can dole out violence where you allow white supremacists to do those things based on the prejudice. So my idea is that there would be a massive sweeping idea of how that stuff would be handled. I also think, and I keep trying to tell people this. You're not going to necessarily cure racism. You're not going to necessarily cure fascism. But if the economy was better, if there wasn't so much economic inequality, if there were more opportunities for people to get jobs and more opportunities for people to be parts of their community, then you would get rid of a lot of fascists. You really would. Because fascism is the last bastion for people who don't have money or power or influence. They go and they join fascist institutions and become radicalized. So if all of a sudden they had like good jobs, good careers, they had standing in their community and things like that, then all of a sudden you would see fascists start to recede and not be radicalized. So there's a lot of things that could be taken care of there. 
El West, any chance of a broad-based public response to Mnuchin's disparaging comments today about how the $600 weekly federal employment bonus was causing folks not to go back to work? No. Unfortunately, this is one of those things where it should be something that we should all be talking about. We should be out in the streets. You know, we should be carrying torches and pitchforks, but it's just a blip. So, no, I don't think this is one of those things that's going to cause big, massive demonstrations or whatever. And I think that shows just how screwed up this country is. Unfortunately, there is the idea that any sort of uh, not just welfare system, but like some sort of, of human system. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think people are engaged in um, they're engaged in game theory to the point where they don't want anybody else to have something they, they don't have. But we need massive systems that will be better for people. Lewis says, did you hear about the media being banned during the RNC? The excuse is COVID sounds like fascism. Uh, so one thing, so one thing the Muckrake podcast is doing is we're doing live coverage of the convention. So if you're interested in any of that type of stuff, send me an email at muckrakepodcast at gmail.com. I don't believe that it's going to be completely media free. I think Trump wants the media there. This is one of those moments where they're smacking around the media. And I think eventually, and you can tell me I'm wrong, and maybe we'll have one of these bourbon nights after I've been proven wrong. Um, I, I, I think the media will be there. I think he'll give a speech. I think the convention will be something. I think they've screwed this whole thing up. That Trump was just like, ah, screw it. I don't care anymore. And then they're just like, well, we're just not going to have, you know, convention credits. They'll do something. Because Trump is going to want to give a speech and he's going to want to get celebrated. So someone's going to end up happening. Yeah, Muckrake. That is, uh, that's the podcast that I do. You should check it out. I think it's pretty good. I think we're doing good work. Uh, Catherine says, do you think the Republican National Convention will try and replace Trump with someone else? No, I don't. I think they took the poison. I think they bought the ticket. They're going to take the ride. Uh, and that's where that's going to go. I truly, truly do. Uh, Kevin says, should Biden avoid a debate? I don't know. I, I, I think a debate at this point is just a roar shock. Um, I, I, I think you watch it and you think whoever you support won. Uh, I, I think debates would be important if they were handled the right way. I don't know who it would help or who it wouldn't hurt or, or you know, I, I don't know how it's going to work. I have to assume that they're going to have a debate, but I've been proven wrong on this stuff before. And God, we're in an unprecedented moment. I, I would ask for a debate. And quite frankly, I keep telling people this. And if anybody is watching right now who is with the Biden campaign, here's my advice. If you get on a stage with Donald Trump, don't go back and forth with his stupid insults. Tell him that you pity him. Tell him how sad he is and how you just feel bad for him and that he's a broken person and he's just got, you know, a bottomless pit that can't be filled with anything and he can't find love or happiness. That's how you defeat Donald Trump. That's how you beat a bully. Tell him you feel bad for them. Comrade Jay, thus far you have nailed how racism works in the U.S., unfortunately. And exposed their actual history. However, what about the class system? It's not equally as exploitive, oppressive, and problematic in similar ways, but is utilized by fascistic elements in our society. It all goes together. One of the things, and by the way, uh, a, a book that I also put on the um, uh, reading list. And again, if you want that, you can send an email to muckrakepodcast at gmail.com. We're opening up that Patreon. If you support what I do, it would be awesome if you signed up for that because it would really, really help out. I have no interest in selling mattresses. I have no interest in like, you know, be having to answer to corporate sponsors. I just want to say what I want to say. And I don't want to have to answer to, to, to corporate masters. That just sounds awful. Oh, anyway. Um, one of the books that I put on that reading list is the history of white people. And when you go and you read that book, I believe by Nell Irvin Painter, right? What you start to understand is that the idea of race and racism are tools that were created for oppression, not just of people of color, but it was created also for caste systems. And you can actually go back and you can read uh, a lot of these uh, powerful people, particularly in like the 18th century, the 19th century. Oh, I've got that in a second. This is a Caesar. Um, when you actually look at their comments, they will tell you straight out 18th, 19th century that racism is a way of keeping even white people under economic control. Because if you have a group, let's say black people, right? Or let's say immigrants, right? If you have people down here who are scorned by society, then all of a sudden poor whites feel like they're better than somebody else. And so they'll never come together in solidarity and make things better. 
So it is a tool of division, and unfortunately this country was based on division. James Madison, in creating the system that we have right now, was based on the idea of uh, destroying potential majorities. And he wanted to separate everybody into these low minorities that would all fight against each other. And that's been what America has been based on from the very beginning. So class and race are inexplicably, uh, or they're, they're intertwined. You cannot bring them apart. They're together. And once we start realizing that racism is a game that is fucked with everybody and messed with all of our finances and all of our power, all of a sudden you can come together in terms of solidarity and you can start to realize that we can make this country better once we get past racism. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to start explaining to the people who have been conditioned to be prejudiced that they have been screwed as well. All of these systems and architectures of power are based on keeping all of us under the wealthy and the powerful under their thumb. So once you start realizing that, that these are cudgels to destroy us and keep us from solidarity, you can do good work. Uh, Caesar said, how do we counter the Marxist narrative uh, about Black Lives Matter? Simple. Every civil rights movement since 1917, when the communist revolution took over Russia, every one of those movements... Every civil rights movement starting in 1917 has been told with a story that Russia is trying to manipulate people of color into destroying America. That's been, uh, it goes back to the first Red Scare, which was actually post-World War I. Of course, it took place after World War II. It took place in the 60s and the 70s. It took place actually during uh, the Los Angeles riots in the 1990s, and it's taking place in Black Lives Matter. It's the same story, time and time again. And now, it, the amazing thing is people like Crenshaw and Cotton and all of these idiots, uh, they, they just keep saying, well, the Marxists are doing it. What Marxists? Who are these Marxists? Where are they? What country are they in? Where, where are they having their meetings? Right? Where are these Marxists? And by the way, Crenshaw gave the game away. And I retweeted this uh, not too long ago. He's like, oh, these are communists, socialists, fascists. Well, when's the last time you saw communists and socialists and fascists hanging out? Because they are natural enemies. They naturally hate one another. The whole point is they're just trying to blame this on whoever they can. That way they don't have to give people rights and deal with economic inequality. So, yeah, it's all a lie. It's always been a lie. David Foster Wallace's bandanas. Cheers to that nickname, by the way. If Trump is gone in January, will Trumpism die with his absence? Absolutely not. You'll have people in America who will support Donald Trump as the greatest president, who, you know, ever for the rest of their lives. Oh, it's Willie Nelson. He doesn't put up with fascists. Willie Nelson doesn't give a shit for fascists. Um, no, you're going to have Trumpists, unfortunately, for the rest of your lives. There's going to be, actually, I, man, I'm trying to remember who wrote this article. I just saw it today, and it absolutely killed. Uh, and it was like, um, you know, certain parts of the South are going to have, um, you know, Donald Trump elementary schools and Donald Trump statues, like the lost cause. I think that's completely true. I think Donald Trump is going to be celebrated by people for the rest of their lives simply because they are so caught up in their mythologies that they'll never get out of it. So no, Trumpism will not die. You, I mean, you might very well have a moment where if the Republican Party rejects Trumpism, and I keep telling people, I think that the Republican Party needs to go away. I think it is terminally ill with fascism and authoritarianism, and it needs to go away and create room for another conservative party because they're not actually conservative. They don't care about your lives. They don't care about small government. They don't care about fiscal or social conservatism. They're not pro-troop. They don't give a shit about any of this stuff. Um, I think that they need to go away. But if they don't, you're going to eventually see people run on a Trump ticket. That's just unfortunately the truth of the matter. Gene, Brexit and Trump were created to weaken international law and stir up pandemonium while the oligarchs carve up the Arctic. Conspiracy theory or grain of truth? Mm, kind of both. Um, Brexit and Trump happened because of nationalistic, white white nationalistic, fascistic movements. Uh, you know, a lot of it was about destabilizing liberal democracy, particularly Western liberal democracy. Russia had a large hand on that, but also the nationalist white supremacist movement had a hand in that. Uh, but I have to tell you that America and Britain being weakened certainly serves a lot of different masters who, and, and by the way, I brought this up earlier, the idea of like corporations who look at things like climate change, 
the, energy companies understand climate change is real. They've known it was real since the 1980s, since before most experts did. They're trying to figure out how to make the most money that they can off of climate change. These people are trying to figure out how to make money off of a climate collapse. That's just the honest to God truth. So it's not about distractions. What you have to understand is that all of this stuff happens at once and people keep trying to figure out one way to win. And they're always trying to figure out a way to win with multiple things. They're always trying to hedge their bets. Christopher Walker thoughts on John Lewis funeral. Uh, I, I, I thought that uh, I think John Lewis is a hero. I think he's one of the best that America has ever had to offer. And I thought that uh, the way that he got treated was really, really beautiful. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that. Matthew says, what are your feelings about USG starting in person? You teaching fully online or hybrid? Got any worries heading to campus? USG is the university system of Georgia. WF says, best ways to apply pressure on upper admin and public universities in Georgia so they stop acting like cowards whenever the Board of Regents tries to kill students for money. Um, so I'm just going to talk very broadly about this. Um, what I will say is this. I, I, I wrote a tweet thread about it. I hope maybe you've seen it. Higher education in America got turned into a really insidious corporate business. And what they're worried about is they're worried about the bottom line. That's not the way it should, should be. Um, higher education and education should be a public good. It should be one of the things that we invest in as a country in order to try and make a better future. Uh, that's not what it's become. It's been juiced as a revenue source, particularly um, in modern times particularly in red states, which I am most definitely in a red state. Uh, so here's the problem. The university systems around this country, every university stands to lose millions of dollars if they don't have in-person classes. It's not a hard question to ask. Do you want to lose millions of dollars or do you want to take a chance on, uh, you know, people getting sick? It's an easy question because, again, going back to what I originally said, when human beings are cogs and they are replaceable, you take that chance because millions of dollars are more important than people. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I know that thousands of people are going to come from all around the country into like my small college town and other small college towns. It's going to be bad when public schools open up and school children go in. It's going to be bad. And I don't know that the schools are going to get shut down. I don't know that the states are going to get shut down. I have no idea what's going to happen. It's going to get really, really bad. Uh, Erica says, how am I teaching courses? Did you alter your syllabi? Here's the only thing I can say. I don't know what's available to you, but I have to say this. You have to be kind. You have to be empathic. You have to understand how many things are happening to these, uh, these students, and you just have to be aware and you have to be flexible. That's the only way that I'm moving into this semester. Rob, please talk about the risk to teachers if we open up schools right away. Uh, Rob's taking a year off. You have to understand this. Teachers have not been paid what they what they earn. We just haven't. And we've been vilified one after another because of the rights war on education and experts. Uh, they hate us. They treat us like the enemy and they've destroyed us, particularly because of our uh, teachers unions. Um, we've been, we've been shit on for years and years and years and it's done massive damage to this country. It is so hot out here, by the way, this is the, the usual Sunday night tradition. At this point, I end up a couple of glasses of bourbon in and it's hot. I brought water that, this week. It is so hot. Um, but you also have to understand that a lot of teachers are going to be going into the classroom, understanding that they're risking their lives and they're not going to have, um, they're not going to have the life-saving equipment that people in hospitals and emergency rooms are going to have. And a lot of them are going to go in there and risk their lives. Um, there is a potential that eventually teachers are going to get, are going to walk off the job. That's going to help people like Betsy DeVos. But again, all of this requires solidarity. We all need to come together and we all need to take care of each other. And we all have to go from grassroots up as opposed from top down. And once we get there, we'll get better. George says, I'd love to hear your interpretation of all the symbolism in this recent propaganda art piece. For those who didn't see it, this is the picture of like all the presidents and American heroes laying hands on Trump. They worship him. He's a messiah to them. And so they're taking him and they're trying to run him through the lens of American exceptionalism because it's a religion. It's a cult. And they see him as a cult leader. And that's unfortunately what's happening. I wish I had a porch fan out here. I really do. Por Fans have become such a huge thing. I live in the South. They're a massive, massive thing. But I do not have one on my, por on my porch, unfortunately. So anyway, they worship him. He's a cult leader. 
he's a messiah to them. So they're obviously going to put him up there with like America's greatest. Dialectical says general topics I'd love to listen to you chat about de-escalating a society, getting out in front of fascism, convincing middle America to move away from the right. These are the massive projects that need to take place. We need to figure out a way to get past the idea of, um, of, of game theory. We need to get past the idea where if I win, you lose. We need to get to the point where everybody wins and we take care of one, of it, one another. I think what will eventually happen, uh, hopefully, hopefully, um, is that we'll move past the point of the military-industrial complex because the military-industrial complex creates a system of austerity. It takes all of our money, puts it in a project that we don't actually need, and then makes us all fight over scraps. Um, if we can get past that point and we can start taking a little bit of money back for ourselves, back from everything from law enforcement to the military industrial complex, all of a sudden we're not going to be fighting each other as much. But one of the reasons we're fighting each other the way that we are is because of austerity. And when you're in an austerity environment, you fight each other because you got to fight over scraps. I wrote this in the people are going to rise like the water's upon your shore. The problem is the Republican Party tells us these are the scraps you have to fight over. They cannot imagine a larger pie. They cannot imagine taking money out of those defense systems because it's all about white supremacist paranoia. Sam says, can you cover your thoughts on Musk? Uh, just real fast, I talked about this before. Musk is at a point of uh, post-politics. He doesn't care about us. He wants to get off of this planet. And I mean this. This is not exaggeration. This isn't science fiction. Elon Musk really wants to colonize the planet of Mars. And he wants to get to Mars so he can get past federal and uh, democratic laws. He wants to create a libertarian planet where he is in charge and basically everyone is free. But they're not free. They're going to be driven by market ideas. If you've ever seen Total Recall, Elon Musk's Mars will be worse than Total Recall. So what he wants to do is he wants to create his own libertarian empire. It's, it's absolute insanity. Bob, hoping to hear how Americans' neo-fascist movement compares with what's going on in some European nations, other than U.S., who is closest to becoming a full-out fascist state. There are a lot of them. And that's the sad truth. There are a lot of them. Uh, what's happening in Brazil right now is like this weird um, warped mirror of what's happening here. Uh, and as well, I mean, of course, it's happening in Turkey. Um, you know, Russia is already just like a, a dictatorial state. Yeah, he wants to be John Galt. That's exactly. And I bet he's reading right now. He's, you know, reading some sort of uh, Ayn Rand thing. Fun thing about Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand died on government assistance. So, you know. Whatever. Not going to gloat about that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that there is a major worldwide fascistic movement. That's just the truth of it. It all works together. And, and all of these groups are coming to prominence. And by the way, the problem here, and I should have talked about this earlier. I'll talk about it now. We're now in 22 in. Uh, the problem is that globalism doesn't work. Hypercapitalism doesn't work. It's failing. And so the only people who are coming up for an alternative, a massive worldwide alternative, are these nationalists, these fascists, these neo-fascists. They're the ones who are offering an alternative to globalism. We don't need to hide behind globalism. We need to come up with an alternative that actually looks at people and provides better lives. It provides progress. It provides a, a, a better state of being. Oh, she sucked. Ayn Rand sucked. Terrible writer, too. Oh, if you haven't already, there's an Adam Curtis uh, documentary. And by the way, you should totally check out uh, Adam Curtis. Wonderful stuff. If you go back and you watch uh, his coverage of Ayn Rand, it is, it's incredible. I believe the, the one I'm talking about is All Watched Over by Machines of Love and Grace. Um, really great documentary series, but it gets into Ayn Rand and how big tech idolizes her. Terrible. Cat, 32% in drop in GDP and stock market went up over 100 points on Friday. Expound. Here's the truth. Um, our economy is not set up to represent our well-being. It's just not. It's set up to take care of the, the wealthy and the elite. Uh, this is one of the reasons why in one of these moments, uh, the pandemic, it continues to go up. Or with Trump, it goes up. It's not interested in how our lives get better. That's not the way this thing is wired. When you get into a hyper-capitalistic hyper, uh, situation, uh, all of a sudden, the stock market is completely divorced. It's just what ends up happening. 
Amber, two-part question. Please explain the state-by-state -state House vote that might occur if the Trump admin finds a loophole to exploit and challenge the election results. Two, if Trump somehow retains power and Barr gets to implement his wish list for the U.S. could that please be your handmaid. I, uh, the idea that Barr could have any influence in a second term of the presidency is terrifying. Oh, my God. The Dominionists are the people who want to create a, a, a Gilead-type situation. It's terrible. Um, in terms of the House system, the idea is that the Supreme Court might throw it to the House of Representatives. But again, like I was saying earlier, um, I have no faith that things will work the way that we think they will. I don't think authoritarians... Uh, oh, I'm good. I'm all right. I'm powering through. I'm good. Uh, I, I don't think that our system will stand up to somebody like Trump. I think that if he continues to push it and if the people don't take responsibility, and that's the secret, is I think that the people can make a difference. But I don't think we should expect the institutions to just hold the way they are. Mass Terrible. If they win and remake society, will it be possible to maintain a semblance of happiness or privacy if immigration is impossible? Um, here's the problem. If Trump wins or steals the election and gets away with it, we're going to look at an America that is unfortunately going to seem on the surface to be a regular America, but everything awful is going to be right underneath the surface. Managed democracies exist where it feels like there's freedom, but there's no freedom whatsoever except for the veneer of it. So what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of stuff like this. You're going to see things happening in Portland, and you're going to get on Twitter, and you're going to be like, what the hell's going on? And then it's going to go to the next city, and all of a sudden more people are going to be disappeared. So the sad truth is that if Trump wins or steals the election, it's going to feel like an America, but the, the core is going to be rotten. It's going to get worse. Derek, happy this came up. Derek says, weren't you on the Russiagate train for a while? Anyway, I hope you've hopped off and really appreciate your insights into Trump's murderous use of the pandemic. Here's the thing. You say Russiagate as if it wasn't actually a thing that happened. Uh, we, we don't have to believe in a conspiracy. We don't have to believe that, that Trump and Putin are on the phone with each other talking about things, even though um, they are. Um, you know, I was being told back in the summer of 2016 by people in the Trump campaign that something weird was happening with Trump and Russia. I don't think you have to believe in things like the P-tape. I don't think you have to believe in blackmail. You have to believe that Donald Trump um, is ideologically aligned with things like Putinism. You have to believe that post-political politics exist. And then he looks at it, what Putin has, and he really likes it. And he looks at what Erdogan has, and he really likes it. He looks at what Kim Jong-un has and really likes it. Uh, he has said on multiple occasions that he would accept foreign interference on his behalf. And he did. Do I think that they said, oh, do this on this day? No, they didn't. I think that they're criminals and that they understand how to commit crimes. So was I on Russiagate for a while? Yeah, because things happened. Like there was a weird relationship between Trump and Russia. And I think that we saw that. But there are also criminals who understand how to get around the law. And, and by the way, most like status quo sort of run of the mill people st sort of came around on this thing. So I understand that you want to talk about conspiracy theories, but there is a relationship between Trump and Russia and the American right and Russia. There's also a lot of money back and forth between those people because they are interested in not just committing crimes, but engaging in business with one another. So there is weirdness there. But I appreciate that you appreciate my coverage of the pandemic. So because it's awful. Can, uh, God democracy. Next up. Can you discuss Trump's connection to the mob? It's just a worldwide mob. That's all it is. That's what post politics is. Is it's 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 organized crime on a level that is above the law, and that's what they have done. They want to create a situation where they can destroy government as an impediment to corruption, and they can expedite their profit and their power. That's what they're about, and it's the mob. It just so happens that they're sitting in an office. Everyone knows. Says, what do I think are the odds that Joe Biden wins? It's a different question from what do I think are the odds that Joe Biden will be president. I think uh, the odds that Joe Biden actually wins an election at this point are about 60%. What are the odds that he's president? How could you even guess at this point? You would have to believe that, oh, God, Sarah, you just said about evangelical missions in Russia. I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a second. You have to believe that Trump will throw everything at the wall, and you cannot look at any president. There's never been anything like this. So I don't know what the odds are that Biden will be president. I think that he probably will win the election. But we'll see from there. So Sarah says lots of evangelical missions in Russia. So one of the things that ended up happening here is that not only Republicans, but white identity, white nationalists in America 
They have a natural kinship to Russia. Putinism is about nostalgic white nationalism. They're on the same page. They're anti-democratic institutions because they can't win elections anymore, and so they love what's happening in Russia. That's just the relationship they have. So that cult of the Shining City I talk about is exactly what's going on in Russia. It's the exact same thing. Deanna says there are currently a lot of drama. There's currently a lot of drama over Biden's VP options. Seems like a distraction to me, meant to get folks on the left turning on themselves. How would you su- suggest people keep focused and avoid taking the bait? I don't know who's going to be Biden's VP, but I will tell you this. I'm glad that you said this. Something to remember is the television show that is American politics. They want you to be guessing about who's the VP. It, it, it takes up time. Remember those times you used to be in a doctor's office and like MSNBC or CNN would be on and you just watch it? It's just a TV show. All this stuff is pageantry. Who gives a shit until he announces his VP? Then you can react to it and like it or hate it. That's what it is. This entire horse race idea of how American politics should work, get rid of it. Make, make politics boring and nuanced. That's how we should go. By the way, hour and a half. Cheers. You're hanging out with me on a Sunday, drinking bourbon, hour and a half. That's cool of you. All right. Casey, we got a couple more. Casey, I was hoping you would talk about the Mueller offshoot investigation, the NRA. The NRA is completely without any duty or loyalty to America. They are a corporate institution that is trying to gain their own power. The only way that they gain power is when they make Americans frightened. And when they make Americans frightened, they make a ton of money and they they gain a lot of members. That's what they've always done. They traffic in conspiracy theories. They traffic in white supremacy. They don't care about the fate of America. They care about what happens to them. Ham and Cheese says, do you see parallels between the current U.S. state of distrust and governance and the neo-spoil system in 1850s? Absolutely. Uh, I talked about this last week. If you haven't had a chance, you can go back and check out that uh, talk. I believe that's what I did. But the Gilded Age came about because uh, not just during the Civil War, but post-Civil War, the federal government paid a, a ton of infrastructure companies to, you know, spool telegraph wire and lay railroad tracks, all that stuff. Right now, we're in a new information economy, and all those big tech programs basically hold all of the keys. And on top of that, it's not just that things like Amazon or Facebook or whatever have their own businesses. They're also intertwined with the U.S. government. They take care of their servers. They take care of their information sharing. So, yeah, we, 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 have, we have robber barons now. And so what happened then, and I keep saying this, and I hope people will hear me, we'll win when we realize that we have power. In those times, like Gilded Age and right now, we feel like, oh, we have no power, we have no power, the wealthy and the elite have everything. Once we realize that we are together, the pendulum will swing and solidarity will win out. F. Trump, so much is said about the extreme right raising arms in the street. Do I think the left will peacefully accept another Trump's presidency and doesn't matter who Biden will pick for VP? Um, I think it does matter who Biden picks for VP. Uh, This is a really hard needle to thread. Uh, I'm not going to get into my picks and what I think he should do. I'm not really into political prognostication in terms of campaigns anymore. I think it's kind of useless. Do I think the left will peacefully accept another Trump presidency? I think that if Donald Trump won re-election and all signs show that he won, which I don't even believe could possibly happen at this point because we see, you know, what the popular vote does and how it works. um, I think the left would accept it if all empirical evidence said that he actually won it. I think that's the difference between the left and the right. We're almost there. Tunnel. Barr says he intends to follow the rule of the law. Uh, Maybe an election issue is this foreshadowing. P.S. Your Sunday Night Bourbon Talk series is simply outstanding. Pairs quite well with Yellowstone TV. You ever saw Yellowstone? I hear it's good. That's very kind of you to say about my Sunday night talks. I think Barr's testimony the other day absolutely set the stage for all of this. If y'all didn't notice, he said um, he hadn't looked into whether or not uh, a president could contest the results of an election or could delay an election. He just said left and right. He's ready to do whatever Trump wants. He is a dominionist. He is an authoritarian. He has no problem with that stuff. That's who Bill Barr is. He's an incredibly dangerous uh, attorney general. Jay, dude, besides voting, what are the things regular Americans should be doing now and continuously to fight our side into fascism? I keep saying this. I think it's three parts. One, we're in a pandemic. Take this time to get educated. Understand what has happened. Understand our history. Read into this stuff. Read my stuff. Read other people's stuff. Start understanding the actual real history of America. That way you're armed with actual information. Number two, get pissed off. Get angry. You have been just 
absolutely taken advantage of. Chances are your family has been taken advantage of. People you love have been taken advantage of. The people who have controlled this company have taken advantage of you. They've, they've damned people you loved to lesser, more brutal lives. They've controlled you. You have every reason to get pissed off. Third, get organized. Find other people. Not just in things like this chat, not just in like a live stream with me. Find other people around you who feel this way. Start taking on grassroots responsibilities. Start running for local offices. Start running for your school board so we can have better history textbooks. Um, you know, start getting on your city council. All of these things create a ripple effect. If you start doing good things in your community, it all goes up. We have to reject top down and bottom up. If we go bottom up grassroots, we win. So what you have to do is you have to start building network networks now. You have to start treating uh, stop treating politics as something to watch and and as a spectacle. You have to you have to get involved. You have to throw you have to throw your skin in the game. Josh, after hopefully this nightmare is over with Trump, we have another book lined up to write. Absolutely. I have a book project all, uh, all, all set up to go. Um, we'll see what ends up happening, but um, it's basically a reckoning with the history of the modern world. And uh, I've been having a lot of realizations as I've been having these talks, as I've been you know, writing the last book, American Rule, as I've been doing the research, I'm starting to understand more and more how we got to this point with uh, quote unquote Western civilization. So I'm going to talk about the bigger picture, and I'm going to talk about how we got here and why the reality that we live in looks the way that it does, because it doesn't have to. We can live in a better world. So, yeah, I have a project lined up, and, and hopefully um, hopefully that comes into fruition, and hopefully it'll come out in a post-Trump world or whatever it's going to be called. Last two. Adam, are there any ways in which we aren't totally screwed? Is it more our own racism, misogyny, or xenophobia? It's all three, by the way. All of them put together. You, one, another thing that we have to do, we have to stop looking for silver bullet explanations. The one explanation. It's not true. It's all of them. All of them put together. It's so many different things while we're looking for simplified explanations. It is everything is screwed up and needs redone. That is the truth. Um, and then at the end, really, what's wrong with straight white men? The problem is that straight white men have ruled the world and it's given them unbelievable authoritarian fascistic tendencies. And so as a result, when they actually try and be just regular people, it overwhelms their system and then they overcompensate and then they move towards fascism and authoritarianism. Their problem is that they've controlled the world and that they've screwed it up. It's true. But anyway, is there hope? Absolutely there is. Unprecedented lines says to round out literally everything else that folks are replying with and that I want to hear all about. He said a few weeks ago that joy and love is a natural antidote to fascism, and that thought keeps popping into my head and bringing hope. What's bringing you joy this week? Last question. So I'll bring this back with a little bit of love and a little bit of joy. So here's what I've learned, and I've been trying to tell people this for the past couple of years. Donald Trump is a monster. He really is. This is a broken destroyed person he has a bottomless pit inside of him it, he is he is the personification of hyper capitalism he will never have actual joy and so as a result he just has to destroy everything around him he know he doesn't know love he doesn't know joy period the fact that we do and the fact that we know what love is and the fact that we now care about politics to the point where we've been hanging out for an hour and a half on a Sunday talking about this shit means that we can win because the people that we're talking about who don't know joy and don't know love, their plans for the future suck. They're anti-human. They are so fragile because they have nothing to do with the human condition. What we need is a world that takes care of people and builds up people and is human and, 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 and strong and it can exist. And it's not just something, something to throw away. It's something that can last because it's true and real. Fascists have to constantly change reality. They have to constantly destroy people because they can't inspire people because they can't inspire joy and love. We have joy and love and truth on our side. What brings me joy is that post-Trump's election, 
people are now coming up to me and they're talking to me about legislation. They're talking to me about the Constitution. They're talking to me about history. And what that tells me is that the American people are waking up. Trump has, unfortunately, through his existence and through his ascent to power, he has woken us up to our situation. The fact that we're having a conversation about how different American reality is from what we've all experienced, that tells me that something has broken. So we have a chance. We have a big chance. And I said this earlier tonight. If we can look into the dark abyss of fascism and recoil in horror, we can start to decide how to be better. We can reject foreign wars. We can reject military industrial complex. We can, uh, we can reject inhuman hypercapitalism. We can start looking for a country that, uh, you know, make sure that people get educated, they get health care, they get taken care of, that nobody has to be thrown out into the streets. It's bullshit. Fascism is built on bullshit. And the reason why they're fascist is because they can't convince anybody. They have an idea that is based on their own power and their own profit. And so nobody believes it. So they have to crush them. That's what fascism is, is it means I can't win. I can't win elections and I can't win the hearts and minds of people. So I have to destroy them and murder them. We have truth and joy and love on our side. We can make things better, but we have to believe that we have power. We have to stop treating politics like a spectacle on a TV show to watch. We have to start treating it as if we are in the battle. We have to start running for local offices. We have to start educating ourselves. We have to start getting organized and pissed off. So I have hope. And I'm, I'm really upset this week. The idea that they would de uh, delay an election, which, by the way, you know is code for not have an election, or the idea that they would steal an election, or the idea that they have uh, damned hundreds of thousands of Americans to die from a pandemic, hundreds of thousands of Americans, God knows how many people, to get COVID-19 and then have permanent heart, lung, brain damage. The fact that they've done that is disgusting enough. But we can do better. We know that this is failure. We know that this is screwed up. We can do better. So that is what gives me hope. We know that this is wrong. We have some skin in the game. We're hanging out here on a Sunday night talking about politics an hour and 41 minutes in. That tells me that people care. That tells me that people can do better. So that's why I say cheers to tonight. That's why I get hope from. Cheers. All right. So. It's going to be a long week. A lot of things going on. Um, we're going to have a new uh, Muckrake podcast come out on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to have a couple of Muckrake blogs come out um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, we're going to keep fighting the good fight. If you are interested in supporting my work and supporting the Muckrake podcast, um, we're getting ready to enter into a uh, Patreon system so we can start doing some long form journalism, some big giant independent projects. Drop me a line at muckrakepodcast at gmail.com. We're getting ready to launch that this week. We're really, really damn excited about it. If you haven't already, check out my book, uh, American Rule. It's available for pre-order. It comes out in a month. I'm shocked. It's doing really well. I appreciate everybody who has helped out and all of the kind words. I'm so excited for you guys uh, to get a chance to read this. I, I put my heart and soul and blood, sweat, and tears into this thing. I hope it makes a difference. Um, and again, just to be real, um, means the damn world to me that you would come out and hang out with me on a Sunday. This has become uh, my favorite part of the week. That's right. Uh, MuckrakePodcast at gmail.com. This has become the best part of my week, hanging out here and just uh, drinking some bourbon and talking with you. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the support. I appreciate the love. It's love and joy and truth. We're going to beat them back. We're going to beat the fascist. We got to believe that. If we don't believe that, we're just going to, we're going to fall to them. They're going to have their way. So we're going to beat fascism. We're going to be better. We're going to have a better future because we can't let these people win. Right? Right. All right, everyone. Cheers. Much love. Be safe. We'll do this again next week. In the meantime, check out all the other stuff. Thanks, everybody. Take care.